Welcome to yet another day of CES coverage live from Las Vegas. It's been quite a fun day today. I'm Nikki Gordon Bloomfield. I'm Kate Walton Elliott. And we've had a little less to do this day, reasons for which will become apparent later on in this roundup show. But we got up nice and early. We pushed up yesterday's roundup video, which I know some of you enjoyed and we headed down to the Strip, where, Kate, we have been very busy looking at all kinds of weird things. Now, you started off taking a drive in a very special car. Well, it was more of a car equipped with some very special equipment. So it was equipped with the iLights product, which is a holographic head-up display. You can tell it where you need to go, and then it will give you directions. So it is a device that uses a polarizer on the screen to produce a head-up display. The idea is that it's much less distracting for you than peering down at your phone. And it also, the app installed with it, gives you limited access to other apps on your phone. So you can control music, you can change your directions, you can um, not get to your messages. Which seems really stupid because, you know, the latest implementation of both Android Auto and Apple CarPlay will read your messages for you and ask if you want to respond to them. So it's pretty much a hands-off experience, at least it is for me in my car. The idea is, and the discussions that they had with drivers suggested that those kinds of things are still quite distracting. So you're thinking about something else and that is not conducive to good driving. So they asked people what they wanted and these are the apps that they wanted available on the phone. So you can control it using gestures or using, uh, it has a tie-in with Alexa, but you can actually use, if you have Google Voice or you have Siri, it will work with those. But the actual software itself that they install is really intended for Alexa. So it's a super imposition on a polarizing part of the car windscreen. Yes. Of the information that you want. Yes. So we've seen head-up displays for a long time. So what makes this different? So the idea that makes it different is really the quality of the display. It's much sharper than a lot of other displays. It's much larger than a lot of the head-up displays that you've seen. And they've worked, they say, very hard to make sure that the polarizer that you put on the screen has sufficient transparency that it doesn't really affect how much you can see through the screen. I would say you, it did make the screen a little bit darker and certainly if you use um, a, an app with a white background, so Google Maps during the day, that you can't really see through. Their own navigation app, which they're working on to really improve, but it is functional, um, that is designed with a black background. So you can see straight through and that. actually that worked very well. The gesture stuff, they didn't have in the car, so I can test it, um, but they do have a history of actually producing functional hardware. Right. So this, this is an Indiegogo project that's going to be coming out soon. They're launching um, it, right. Yeah, they haven't given me the date. They did say they'd send the press pack over to me. Um, but they do have a partner in China. It sounds they. I asked all the questions about how are you producing this? Who are you producing it with? They gave me the right kind of answers. Obviously, it's an Indiegogo. You can't ever guarantee those. You can put your money in and end up with nothing. But I would say it sounds like they are actually going to successfully produce the product. And I would say if you have an older car and you do not have a head up display and you would like one, it seems like a really good option. I'm not particularly convinced. I'm just going to say that now. Yeah. I, I like head up displays. And one of the reasons that, that I'm not particularly convinced is I've seen other head up displays here. We're talking about one of them later on that seem to have a little better implementation, a, a better use case scenario. And if it's another device that you fit to your car, it increases the risk that something's going to get stolen and your car is going to get broken into. Yeah, that is always a concern. I, I would say that if you have an older car and you don't mind pulling something out when you park, it seems like a reasonable option. Okay, so while you were doing that, I was off in the CEA Tech Village, which is a, a group of, of products that have been developed at CEA in France. And one of those products was Sigma Cells. Now, Sigma Cells is a new type of battery management system for lithium ion batteries. In fact, for any type of battery that not only balances the cells individually, but can also switch on the fly between series and a parallel operation. Each battery is independently monitored 
the entire unit, the battery management system that sits next to the battery, integrates charging, discharging, and even inverter functions. So it's an AC battery pack, not a DC battery pack. It's an AC battery pack, or rather you can treat it as an AC battery pack because you plug it into your car and you bring out high voltage, low current AC wiring that goes directly to your electric vehicle's motor. Now it's still in kind of development phase. They've got some applications that they've been working on, including bicycles and drones and things like that. They believe that this technology could be used in the future for cars. And what makes it really special is that the battery management system doesn't just ensure that the pack doesn't go below its minimum or maximum voltage, but if there is a battery that is getting weak, which means it can't store as much energy as some of the other cells in the pack, it will actually adjust how that cell performs and shunt the demand to other batteries, in, to other cells in the battery pack. So presumably that means you might get packs that can last longer because right. the weakest cell isn't the defining factor for a pack. Right, in fact, it, it can help prevent premature battery aging. Not only that, but it ensures that when the car is discharged, all of the battery cells are the same voltage, which is something you don't get in a conventional electric vehicle battery pack. No. If you look at my Nissan Leaf, for example, there's, there can be as much as an 80 millivolt difference between the, the highest charged cell and the lowest charged cell. Yeah. And as batteries age, that difference gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Mm. Battery suppliers, battery manufacturers do their best to match cells in packs when the packs are brand new. But over time, the minuscule microscopic differences between the cells mean that the batteries will age differently. And that's what this new Sigma cell technology could help solve. And it's, it, it also opens the door, for example, to having modular battery systems, if OEMs come on board, where the battery packs are the same for all vehicles. That would be just an amazing change. So you could have battery so swappable, you could have battery swap stations. Yeah. Where the battery packs would be swapped into the car, they would have a nominal voltage and a nominal capacity, mm -hmm. but if the battery was put in a car that required a higher voltage or a lower voltage, the Sigma cell system would switch on the fly to ensure that the parameters of the motor were what ruled what was going yeah. on, rather yeah. than you know making sure that the battery pack and the motor are, are matched. The battery pack could effectively be like a chameleon and change its characteristics to suit the demands of the vehicle, or perhaps even the specific use case scenario. Yeah. So you could use this in race days as well. I mean, imagine, for example, having a racing. Uh, racing profile for a track day with a motor that could go on a higher voltage but during the week doesn't use that because you just want to have the long range at the weekends increase the voltage and have a shorter range but go much faster but go much faster so that was fun and one other thing that you mentioned with that was that this removes the need to have expensive mosfets and you instead have much cheaper transistors and that probably has a significant impact on the cost of the packs. Yeah, so because everything's done at the cell level, everything is really low voltage, which means they don't produce a lot of heat, which means the battery pack doesn't get as hot. And because also you're monitoring the battery pack and ensuring that battery cells that are getting weak are not asked a lot of, uh, are not forced to provide a lot of current, that also reduces internal resistance heating because as batteries discharge, when they get to the very bottom of their charge, they do tend to heat up because they have to provide a higher current for the same power output than they would when they were fully charged. So it appears they've just turned the lights off in the North Hall. We're gonna wrap this fairly soon. So yeah. let's push through and we'll figure out exactly what else we've looked at today. So we then went to Nissan's booth. Nissan had the See the Invisible tagline that Nissan has been teasing us with all yeah. show. Nissan had me drive a virtual reality car. Well, it was an augmented reality car. Yeah. And it was a bit of a bizarre demonstration. It was supposed to highlight technology that could allow you in the future to have your car work alongside you to ensure that the road ahead was nice and clear, to ensure that everything was easy to follow and you could have 
optimum conditions displayed. If it was a rainy day, for example, the car would superimpose what it looks like on a good day. The car could coach you using a, a lane guidance and sometimes maybe even get somebody else to come and sit beside you in the virtual reality so to coach you, you on your driving. Yeah, so you could have your little rally day. That seemed to be the uh, general idea. So you have your autonomous vehicle that drives itself, but then you can drive at the weekends for fun. But yeah. here's the thing, Nissan's execution on this was really poor. Mm. And unlike the BMW demo we had yesterday and the Audi demo we had on Sunday, I didn't feel part of the experience. It was difficult to see because of the lighting and I can't really comment much more on that. So mm. let's get on with two new stories that I want to cover very quickly that have come up today, both involving Tesla. So the first yes. one is the family of a young man who was killed when the Tesla Model S he was in hit a wall at a hundred and some miles per hour are suing Tesla for building a car with what they claim is a defective battery pack. Yes, and also I believe they mentioned removing the speed limiter. Yeah, so they, they claim that they'd one. asked Tesla to put a speed limiter on and then their son, who was 18, had then had another service center remove that speed limiter. And again, they're trying to sue Tesla over this. Now, for this particular case, Tesla's been very sensible. It said no car would survive an accident at that speed. And Tesla's quite right. There yeah. are no industry tests that test crashworthiness at speeds beyond what would be considered legal. Yes, yeah, I mean, I don't think even in Germany they test cars at that sort of speed, despite you being able to drive right. on the autobahn. Un unfortunately, physics is physics. Physics is physics. All right, the next important story to talk about is that Tesla has announced the 75 kilowatt hour battery pack variants of the Model S and Model X are going away. Yes. It's moving to essentially selling the Model S and Model X with a long range and medium range battery pack or standard range battery pack. So getting rid of the battery pack capacity. Several outlets have suggested this is because Tesla is moving from the 18650 cells that it has been using in Model S and Model X for the last, you know, however many oh, years. Many years. Yeah. to the 2170 cells that it makes at the Gigafactory that are the cells that power the Model 3. So it could be that then we're going to see at Gigafactory all batteries made for all Teslas, which makes sense. That could reduce the cost for Teslas in the future. And that's something they really need to do, having right. suddenly been put in the position of saying, well, we're going to cut the prices on our cars by a fairly substantial chunk. Right. And... The challenge here, though, is it now means the cheapest Model S you can buy is $94,000 in the United States. Yeah, that's quite pricey. And the cheapest Model X you can buy is $97,000. I will buy two then. Yeah. All right. So let's talk about our T-shirts because yes. we've been talking about our T-shirts all week. You are wearing a very nice geeky T-shirt here. Yes, this is my uh, BBC Master T-shirt because... Uh, that was the first computer I had was a BBC Master. It wasn't the first computer I used. Right. But they were very good. I remember the BBC Micros from when I was at school. Excellent, I, excellent computers. I still have one. You still do? Yes. And you brought it all the way to America with you? I did. I haven't used it recently, but, but it, but it is here. Did. I'm not having a geeky t-shirt today. I did ask Kate to bring geeky t-shirts to CES and she has outdone me at every turn. <laughs> I'm wearing one today that says, respect my existence or expect my resistance. It was one that was inspired yesterday by a bit of a run-in that we had as a team at the monorail station in, in here at yes, the CES. Here in, in this, or just this outside, station, this, yeah. this station at the uh, Las Vegas Convention Center. There was a police officer who got very upset that we were trying to bring our gear through and go up the lift to gain access to the platform. He told us that we, we couldn't take all of our gear up onto the platform. There was too much gear and he made us dismantle all of our stuff. And then when I asked to actually go in the lift, he got really snippy with me and said we couldn't go up in the lift. And I'd said, well, I'm sorry, but if we take these up on the escalators, we might drop something and hurt someone. We don't want to do that. And he maintained that it was just access for um, disabled people. Yes. And eventually begrudgingly let us up in the lift. And he had a dog with him, a, a Presumably yeah. a police dog of some description. The minute we got to the top of the escalator, though, uh, we got out of the lift. Yeah, I got pulled stopped. over by the police and they said it was a random search. 
which of seems like a very things, odd but they were very specific with me. It was me yes. that they were looking for. And the theory is from the crew that how I caused problems for the policeman downstairs by asking if we could use the lift we then were inconvenienced at the top. And it was kind of a scary experience. It was. You know, I'm not a person of colour, so I don't normally get singled out. And it gave me a little bit of an insight. Yeah, it's not fun. And into how that treatment can happen. Let's get back to CES and yes. some of the fun things we did. All right, so this afternoon, we met up with the wonderful Alex Guberman. Yes, from E for Electric. E for Electric, and we filmed here in the studio. Yeah. This is our studio, by the way, up in... Uh, up on the second floor. Yeah, we have a proper studio now. Even though the lights have just gone off. Yeah, but, well, it's sort of only half us. But but there we go. We had a lovely recording session with Alex, about 30 minutes worth talking about all kinds of things. That will yeah. be coming to the channel soon, hopefully maybe Saturday. We'll put that up on Saturday. And then after that, we went to Gentex. Yes, and I think I'm... They, they are a part supplier for other vehicles, which I know we've done quite a lot of this week. But Gentex pretty much supply every Homelink device to mainstream automakers. So if you have a Homelink device in your car, the chances are it's made by Gentex. If you have a self-dimming mirror in your car, it's probably made by Gentex. Yes. And so Gentex is ahead of all of those kind of technologies and it's working on some new dimmable glass, which could help keep your car cool, which of course reduces the need for you to use air conditioning, yeah. which could improve your energy efficiency when you're driving along. Now, this dimmable glass could be programmed depending on who you are. It's also got iris recognition so that when you get in the car, the car authorizes you just by you glancing in the rear view mirror. And then it will set the car to all of the particular settings that you prefer and allow you to go on your way. Sadly, the demo vehicle we sat in was one of these demo vehicles that you see on booze. It's not really yeah. a car. It's just a, a fake car with all of the products in. I was pretty impressed. Yeah. I really was quite impressed. And I'd love to see what they're going to do in the future. They also had a head up display with dimmable glass, which is kind of loops back to what we were saying earlier. And this dimmable glass would be adaptive. So there would be a load sensor on the dashboard that would detect how bright it was outside. And if it was really bright, you were driving in direct sunlight, it would dim the glass. Mm -hmm. so that you could still see your head-up display while seeing the road ahead, which is yeah. going to improve safety for everyone. It is. And then, after that, we met up with a company. Well, we were at Gentex. We got pulled over by a company called AEV Robotics. They wanted us to go and look at their skateboard autonomous trucks. Yeah, so it's a skateboard with a number of different bodies that you can pop on and off. And they said, I think it was six minutes to swap it. Yeah. So you could have it as a passenger pod, you could have it as a garbage truck. I guessed about 70 kilowatt hours for battery pack. They said that was right, but I'm now having second thoughts because the specs don't add up. They talked about in-wheel motors. Well, I, I noticed it had got mm -hmm. in-wheel motors. They said they'd limited the top speed to 40 kilometers an hour. Yes. Because that made it more efficient. Well, it was more efficient and about, they, they were saying it was about safety. So you get a uh, much reduced risk of death. And we know, I mean, from England, we know that that's the 25 mile an hour speed. The but 20 mile this an was an Australian limit. company. And I don't but think many Australians would want to travel anywhere at 40 kilometers an hour because it's a big country. I got the impression they were expecting it to be an urban delivery vehicle, but they didn't know a range. They, they didn't, didn't have a range. They didn't have other key specs and it just made us go, no. You've got some other things you want to see as well. Flying uh, personal flying, drones. Yeah. yeah, you know me and personal drones. Yep. I, I think they're great fun. We're going to try and catch up with the Mercedes-Benz EQC, see what Hyundai's doing and Kia's doing. And maybe try and catch the live wire. Yep, and the live wire. And also go and see those delivery robot dogs as well. Oh, yes. We missed yes. them at Continental today. Yeah. So thanks for joining us. As always, like, comment and subscribe. Hit the notification bell to know the minute a new show is uploaded. And if you'd like to support us on Patreon, please do so. Go to patreon.com forward slash transport evolved or you can send us a coffee through Kofi at kofi.com forward slash transport evolved. Oh, and don't forget those t-shirts we had on yesterday. You can buy them at the transport evolved swag shop. There is a link in the video description below. We'll be back tomorrow. I'm Nikki Gordon Bloomfield. I'm Kate Walton Elliott. And as always, keep evolving.